Okay, so uh, let us continue with our discussion. Um, so, you, you see what we have been doing is looking at uh, zeros of analytic functions. Okay. So, uh, what we saw in the, the last two lectures was um, basically the so called Ruscius theorem okay. and uh, uh, that actually in principle tells you that if you you know perturb an analytic function by a in a small way then the number of zeros that it enclosed that is enclosed in a region is not going to change okay now of course this came out of the basically out of the argument principle and the argument principle in turn came out of uh, the residue theorem okay so we are now we are going to again continue with uh, the study of zeros of analytic functions and uh, of course uh, i should remind you that the 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 argument principle actually tells you gives you a method of counting uh, the number of zeros and poles with multiplicity inside a, a, a closed contour in the region that is enclosed by a closed contour now what i'm going to do this uh, in today's uh, lecture is try to actually look at uh, the uh, zero of an uh, of a function an analytic function that is obtained as a seek as a limit of a sequence of analytic functions okay and uh, what i'm going to say is that essentially the zero of the limiting analytic function is gotten uh, by uh, you know it is gotten by zeros of the analytic functions that converge uh, and taking limits of such zeros okay so you have a sequence of functions that converge to an analytic function if the analytic function has a zero then that zero can be gotten as a limit of zeros of uh, the functions that originally we started with which converge to the given analytic function so this and essentially this is uh, what is called as hurwitz's theorem okay but uh, let so le let me uh, let me start off the discussion like this so you see suppose you have so you have the following situation uh, so d is a domain which means it is an open connected set okay and uh, of course a domain in in C it is a subset of the complex numbers and you have suppose you have uh, a sequence uh, f k f k of functions analytic on uh, analytic for every k greater than or equal to 1 so here is a sequence of analytic functions defined on the domain d and uh, we all you all know from a first course in analysis uh, what i mean when i say that uh, fk converges to a function f pointwise so f is limit k tends to infinity of fk exists okay so uh, this sequence of functions converges to a function this is actually pointwise convergence what does that mean it means you take any point uh, z in d small z in d take the value fk of z for various k you will get a sequence of complex numbers and you take the limit of this sequence the limit of the sequence exists and whatever the limit is that is what you are calling as f of z and you do this for every z in d okay that means f k of z converges to f of z for each point z in d this is pointwise convergence and of course uh, uh, you know that uh, pointwise convergence by itself is not good enough because you know to begin with uh, even if the f k's are continuous okay forget analytic suppose the fk's are just continuous and f is the limit then f need not be continuous so what really helps is 
uh, the notion of uniform convergence if you remember. So, you know if f k converges to f uniformly uh, then uh, and if f k each f k is continuous <coughs> then f is continuous ok. So, <coughs> so of course, uh, so you know if f k each if each f k is continuous and if I want f to be continuous I need uniform convergence, but usually what happens is uniform convergence will not happen on a whole domain ok. Uh, usually it uniform convergence uh, uh, happens only on compact subsets of the domain. In general this is the best condition to assume and this is what will happen. So, so let me write that down uh, and what I am trying to say is that if I assume uh, that f k converges to f uniformly uh, on the whole domain then of course, I will get that uh, not only is f continuous if f k is continuous in fact, f will become analytic if f k each f k is analytic ok. But the fact is you cannot in general expect uniform convergence on a whole open set usually uniform convergence is to be expected on bounded closed and bounded subsets which are otherwise called compact sets because you know in the Euclidean space uh, any subset is closed and bounded if and only if it is compact from from basic topology ok. So, uh, so let so uh, uh, so you can replace the condition that f k converges to f uniformly on the whole domain by a slightly weaker condition which is f k converges to f uh, uniformly on compact subsets of the domain ok. And uh, this technical condition is referred to in some uh, some of the literature as normal convergence ok. So, if f k converges normally to f ok then the fact is that since each f k is analytic f becomes analytic ok. So, it gives you the nice situation that a sequence of analytic functions does converge to an analytic function ok. So, <coughs> that is the first piece of uh, 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 that is the first piece of information that we need. So, let me write this down if uh, f k converges to f uniformly on D then f is analytic on D ok. This is a and of course, you know uh, what do I say uh, what what do I mean when I say f k converges to f uniformly. So, you know there is a difference between point wise convergence and uniform convergence. So, let me remind you what does point wise convergence means mean it means that if, if you take a point small z in capital D and you take the you evaluate the sequence of functions at that point you will get a sequence of complex numbers you will get the sequence f k of z and that f k of z will converge to f of z ok. And f k of z converges to f of z means <coughs> given an epsilon you can find uh, index n such that f f k of z minus f of z can be made in modulus lesser than epsilon whenever k is greater than that index. But if but all this is for a fixed point z in D ok, but if you change the point the index that you will uh, need if you change the point z then the then the index that you will need to make the distance between f k of z and f of z lesser than epsilon will also change in general that index will depend on z also, but if it does not depend on z that is you are able to get a an index such that f k of z the distance of f k of z can be made lesser than epsilon from f of z for all z irrespective of what z it is you choose in the domain that is when you say that the convergence is uniform ok. So, the uniformness is uh, an is that there is no dependence on which point of d you choose ok. So, uniform convergence is uh, of course, stronger than point of convergence and what I am I am I am I am I am making the statement that f k uh, converges to f uniformly <coughs> that is what when I make the statement that is what it means ok. So, you 
you must have come across this in a first course in real analysis or complex analysis but anyway let me remind you. Now but of course this is a very strong condition to expect uniform convergence on a on a whole domain is is in general too much what you normally will get is you will get uniform convergence on closed and bounded or compact subsets of the domain and that condition which seems to which is certainly weaker than this is called normal convergence and the fact is even if you weaken this condition to normal convergence still the limit function continues to be analytic ok. So, let me write that down uh, we say f k converges to f normally in D if the convergence is uniform on any compact which is equal to closed and bounded subset of D ok. So, this is called normal convergence. So, normal convergence is actually uniform convergence on compact subsets ok and of course uh, if you have uniform convergence on the whole domain then of course you have normal convergence because uniform convergence holds on the whole domain then it also holds on any subset of the domain ok and therefore this is a stronger condition than this this is a weaker condition but usually this is what will happen in principle in practice and uh, but the fact is even if you weaken this condition you still get uh, that the limit function is analytic. So, let me write that in this in such a situation f is again analytic on d ok. So, uh, so, having looked at this um, of course, what is our aim? Our aim is actually to uh, show that a uh, show that in this situation that is if you have sequence of analytic functions converging to f normally in a domain then you give me a 0 of the limit function ok give me a 0 of the limit function then that 0 is gotten by zeros of the uh, functions in the sequence. Uh, by convergence ok that is a 0 of f is an accumulation point of zeros of f k that is essentially what uh, Hurwitz theorem is ok. So, uh, but but before that let me uh, take a uh, small diversion to explain why is it that if f k converges to f uh, uniformly or uh, even normally why is it that the uh, limit function is again analytic ok. So, uh, I mean I am doing this purposely uh, many of you must have come across this in a first course in complex analysis, but I am just doing this so that you you, you recall some basic things and, uh, and it is to help you refresh your memory ok. So, you see you know so how does one prove this that is that is exactly what I want to say uh, suppose f k converges to f normally in D suppose this is the case ok. Now, how do I show that uh, and given given of course, that each f k is analytic how do I show f is analytic ok. So, uh, so just think about it you know if you want to show a function is analytic there are so many ways of showing one is of course, you show that it is differentiable at every point it is differentiable one at every point which means you have to calculate the derivative at every point and show that the derivative exists ok. The other way is of course, to write out the Cauchy Riemann equations and check that they are valid uh, and also to check the first partial derivatives uh, which satisfy the Cauchy Riemann equations are continuous ok. But of course, there is a deeper theorem which says that you do not have to check the, the continuity of the first partial derivatives it is enough to check that the Cauchy Riemann equations hold and of course, uh, 
uh, it is very important that you assume f is uh, uh, you will have to use the fact that f is continuous okay. So, first of all because you have normal convergence it means that uh, if I take a point and if I take a, uh, a closed disc surrounding that point a closed disc surrounding that point in, in the in the domain D then of course that is a compact subset of D because it is closed and bounded and f k will converge to f there uniformly and since each f k is continuous analytic of course means it is continuous. So, the limit function f will also become continuous ok. So, the continuity of the limit function will come automatically just because of uniform convergence ok and now I could choose uh, such a disc at every point of the domain and therefore, I get continuity at all points. So, what I wanted to first understand is the moment I make such an assumption to begin with f is automatically continuous on the whole domain ok. Then of course, our question is how do you show that f is uh, analytic. So, uh, the uh, of course, the uh, as I told you one is to show it is differentiable at each point the other one is to show that uh, the first part I mean the f satisfies the Cauchy Riemann equations and uh, uh, the third way is of course, to show that f is locally represented by a convergent power series ok. You see and but these things are not so easy to do in general they are not so easy to do. What really you can use in principle to show that a function is analytic is to check the conditions of Morera's theorem which is a you know a con kind of converse to Cauchy's theorem. So, you see if you remember uh, uh, so let me let me say the following thing how do we show so let, so let me write this how do we show f is analytic. So, this is our question ok. So, I will draw a line here. So, so if you recall first is Cauchy's theorem ok. Suppose f uh, so let me use g uh, uh, so let me use d I need not use the same d, but anyway let, let it be let it be. So, let g from d to c be analytic ok. Uh, then uh, integral of g of z d z over comma a simple closed curve is 0 for every simple closed for every simple closed contour gamma whose interior belongs to 2 d ok. And of course, uh, whose, whose interior and of course, I should say uh, uh, gamma itself is a sub of d the contour itself should be in the domain and the interior of the contour should also be in the domain. So, that means, uh, there is a standard orientation on the contour the orientation is such that uh, the interior of the contour lies to your left as you traverse the contour. For example, if you traverse if the contour is a circle if you traverse it in the anti clockwise sense then the interior of the circle will lie towards your left if you walk on the circle that is called orientation and whenever you do a, a path integral you have to orient the path the path has to be oriented a direction has to be given. And if it is a closed <coughs> if it is integral over a closed path uh, or a loop then the orientation is always given uh, is, uh, is said to be positive if, if, you, if the region inside the contour is it uh, lies to the left as you walk along the contour in the direction prescribed. So, and of course, when I say simple closed contour uh, uh, by contour I mean a curve which is piecewise smooth. So, it is a continuous image of an interval a closed interval 
with starting point equal to the ending point and uh, the interval can be divided into closed sub intervals such that the parameterizations are given by smooth functions they are given by functions which are not only differentiable but the derivative is continuous okay. So a contour is a piecewise smooth uh, curve okay. So this is this is Cauchy's theorem right. So what it essentially tells you is that you integrate an analytic function over uh, a closed curve like a loop and you are going to get 0 okay. Now what is Moreira's theorem? It is like a yeah, well partial converse to Cauchy's theorem so here is Moreira's theorem if and what does it say it says if g from d to c is uh, continuous and if integral over gamma g of z d z is 0 for every gamma as above okay. So I should say something here for every not gamma as above slightly weaker for every gamma in D for every closed curve simple closed contour gamma in D gamma in D then G is analytic okay. This is Moreira's theorem Moreira's theorem is like a cosh converse to Cauchy's theorem but it is a partial converse because you see in Moreira's theorem you have to assume already that the function g is continuous okay uh, and then uh, so that is uh, you need continuity of g that is one extra thing that you need but what you leave out is you are just saying that over any loop sitting inside d the integral of the function is 0 which is the condition of Cauchy's theorem but it is weaker because here the loop had to be such that the interior of the loop had also to be in D whereas here I am not putting the condition there I am just saying that the loop the interior of the loop need not be in D it is not uh, it is not required okay that means this this case this will work for a region with a, with a hole this will work for a region with a hole and to to give you an idea of why this is true you see you see the so you see suppose you have uh, 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 idea of proof of Moreira's theorem uh, see suppose see suppose I have a suppose my domain D is like this it might have some holes suppose this is my domain okay the shaded region it might have holes okay so suppose but the domain is of course a uh, the op an open connected set okay if it has no holes then it is called simply connected and that is the condition that any closed loop can be continuously shrunk to a point uh, without going out of the domain for example if there is a hole then a loop surrounding that point cannot be shrunk continuously to a point without going outside the domain so this is not simply connected this uh, I mean domains like this are called uh, multiply connected they are not simply connected and see what look at the condition see the condition is see suppose I fix suppose I fi how do I use that condition that the integral over any any closed loop is 0 so you take a point you take a point z0 you fix a point z0 okay and take any other point z okay what you do is you just join z0 to z by a path uh, gamma okay 
and then what you do is you look at the you look at the function h of uh, z given by integral over gamma of uh, f of z dz look at this function okay. Now first what I want you to understand is that uh, f is continuous f is continuous therefore f is continuous on the whole domain okay uh, therefore f is continuous also on the arc and you need continuity on the arc to be able to compute the uh, arc integral or the path integral because the continuity uh, is basically done using the notion of a Riemann integral you just form Riemann sums over the arc you parameterize the arc okay which means that you think of this as an image of uh, uh, an interval on the real line and then you are actually integrating over that integral in interval the composition of f with gamma where gamma is a parameterization of the arc okay. So the point is that uh, and of course that will involve that will need the fact that the that uh, uh, the parameterization of this arc is uh, piecewise uh, smooth okay. So what I want to tell you is that this is well defined okay this is well defined because f is continuous okay. So in uh, you know uh, so so if you want I can in fact write it as uh, t equal to a to t equal to b f of gamma of t into gamma dash of t dt where gamma is a map from the closed interval a b into d such that gamma traverses uh, capital gamma from z0 to z and gamma uh, and gamma dash t is piecewise continuous on a b. So this is how you write the <coughs> uh, 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 so let me see whether I have written it correctly I think probably I should not put a gamma yeah z is so yeah so you formally write it as z uh, on the on the on the curve on the on this path capital gamma you write a point uh, omega as omega is equal to gamma of t then d omega will become gamma dash of t dt and that is how you get this gamma dash of t dt okay. So uh, I think there is a little bit of uh, probably I should uh, I should avoid z here because the same z also is used here so let me use omega let me use omega because that is better because you know uh, what will happen is uh, uh, omega if you take a point omega on the on the arc then omega is just gamma of t where t varies small t varies from a to b and then you will see that d omega will be gamma dash of t dt and that is how I replace formally this d omega by gamma dash of t dt. We do this formally but then you can actually make it rigorous by the definition of the Riemann integral okay you this is actually limit of Riemann sums okay. But mind you what you have used in the process is mind you to do define a Riemann integral now you see this is an integral on the real line on the uh, on this closed interval on the real line and you know to integrate a function you know uh, it should be at least piecewise continuous f is already gamma is continuous and f is continuous so the composition this is this is just the composition f circle gamma so that is continuous so it is a continuous function of t and gamma dash of t is piecewise continuous because that is what I told you a what a contour means a contour of path is always assumed to be piecewise continuous that means the parameterization small gamma of the contour capital gamma must have a derivative which is piecewise uh, continuous. So you see unless I do not unless I ha unless I have these continuity of these two things I cannot define this integral okay that is where the technicality comes in okay you have to notice that okay. So the point is in any case I can define this but the more important thing is I defined it based on gamma and I am but I am writing it only as h of z where z is the end point of gamma. So the question is 
uh, what is the dependence on gamma? Am I being care careless about the dependence on gamma? But the answer is that is exactly where I am using this condition that the integral of uh, uh, okay, I think I have messed up something. Oh, so it should be g here. Sorry, this should have been g because it's this g I am trying to show is uh, is uh, analytic. Okay, so I'm thinking of this g. Okay, uh, uh, which is of course. Uh, uh, so somehow I change notation from f to g okay so it is g that I am worried about. So my situation is like this I have a domain d I have the function g defined on d with values in complex numbers and it satisfies the the uh, the conclusion of Cauchy, Cauchy's theorem that integral over every loop is zero okay okay and uh, the extra condition is g is already assumed to be continuous. It's already assumed to be continuous. So, uh, so I look at this integral, okay. And the fact is that this doesn't depend on gamma because you know if I took some other path, gamma prime, okay, it will also this will also be equal to integral over gamma prime of g tab g omega d omega. This will also be true. That's because integral over gamma followed by uh, the inverse. Uh, uh, of the path gamma prime which is minus gamma prime will be 0 that is here is where I am using the condition that the integral over a closed path is 0. So this therefore HZ is well defined it, it, it really does not depend on what path I am choosing and it also does not worry if uh, there are holes in the region mind you okay. Now you see now it is a now it is a matter of uh, now it is very easy it is something like the fundamental theorem of uh, integral calculus see what you are actually saying is you are saying that h is the integral of g. So you can immediately say that the derivative of h must be g okay. So that is a, a fundamental theorem of calculus kind of statement and what this will tell you is that you will you will get from this that g dash of uh, sorry h dash of z is actually g of z you will get this this is just a version of the fundamental theorem for integral calculus. So all you are saying is uh, in other words what you are saying saying is that you know if g is continuous and uh, g satisfies this condition that integral over every loop is 0 then g has an g has a uh, an anti derivative the uh, in other words there is a function uh, 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 so I should say uh, 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 then the, the g is the derivative of a function okay g is the derivative of a function but you see but what does this tell you see it tells you h is differentiable it tells you h is differentiable on d that means h is analytic on d okay but if but you know one thing if a function is analytic then all derivatives exist and the derivatives are also analytic therefore since so this equation in one go tells you that not only is h analytic because it is differentiable once everywhere but because it is it is analytic its derivative is also analytic and that will tell you that g is analytic and that is how you prove Morera's theorem okay. So, so this implies h is analytic and that implies h dash is analytic h dash is g is analytic okay. So that is the that is the sketch of the proof that is how Morero's theorem is proved okay. Now it is this Morera condition that is very useful to check uh, uh, a function is analytic uh, for example in this situation. So you know so let us go back to that situation suppose f k converges to f normally in d suppose this is true. So you know so you take a so here is your d maybe it may have some holes the one does not bother and I take a point z not in d so here is I take a point z not in d what I am what I have to show is that I have to show 
I want to show that uh, uh, if each f k is analytic I want to show that f is analytic that is that is what I want if each f k is analytic then so is f this is what I want to show how very simple uh, to show a function is analytic at, uh, on a dom uh, on a domain show it is analytic at every point okay. So what I will and mind you showing analytic at every point means it is saying that it is analytic at every point is the same as saying analytic in a neighbourhood of every point okay. So I have to concentrate I should take a, an arbitrary point and I must concentrate on the on a neighbourhood of that arbitrary point which I will take to be a disc. So you know what I will do is I will choose a small disc I will choose a small disc here which is given by uh, uh, let me call this as d sub z0 and what is this uh, choose d sub z0 is open disc centered at z0 small enough radius set of all z in uh, d set of all z such that mod z minus z0 is let us say lesser than some rho subset of t choose for uh, is it not in d such a small disc you can you will uh, uh, because you know d is a uh, basically a domain therefore d is an open set therefore given any point in d there is a small disc surrounding that point which is in the which is in your uh, uh, domain. So choose such a uh, disc but what I will do is uh, uh, I will also assume that the boundary if you want uh, I can uh, the way I have drawn it even the boundary of the domain is inside D but probably I do not need it I do not need it okay. Now you see now what you do is you you look at uh, 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 you try to check f is analytic inside this D z0 okay. If I want to check is check that f is analytic inside this d is it not I will have to show that the yeah, mind you f is already continuous why is it continuous because uh, f k converges to f normally means f k converges to f in every uh, compact subset so it will converge to f in the closure of this uh, disc which will which is this, this disc along with the boundary circle okay. So if you want let me let me also so let me write that assume assume that uh, assume that uh, d z0 closure is contained in t which means uh, it is just saying that mod the set of all points such that mod z minus z0 equal to rho is also in d okay that is the boundary of the disc that boundary circle is also in d okay then you see then f then d z0 bar is compact and so f k converges to f uniformly on on uh, on d z there is uniform convergence because that is what normal convergence means it means uniform convergence on compact subsets and by let me remind you a compact set is something that is closed and bounded the when I take a closure of this disc it is of course closed and bounded okay so it is compact. Now so so what happens is since each f k is continuous so is f because the uniform limit of continuous functions is continuous okay there is no problem about that. And uh, so I have a continuous. So if I restrict my attention to this disk, I have the function f. It is continuous. I want to show it's analytic. I can check the condition of Morera's theorem. All I have to check is that give me a loop inside that disk. If I if I show that for any closed loop inside that disk, a simple closed contour inside that disk, the integral of f vanishes then Morera's theorem will tell me that f is analytic inside the disc okay and in this way I can cover the whole region by small discs and cover all the points that will tell me f is analytic everywhere okay on t 
that is what I want. So, uh, so you know uh, suppose gamma inside d z naught is a simple closed contour. Suppose it is simple closed contour, then uh, integral over gamma of f uh, of uh, f of z dz or let me keep using f gamma f omega d omega is by definition integral over gamma limit k tends to infinity of f k of w omega d omega okay and now I am again using another important fact you see when a sequence of conver functions converges uniformly to a function this uniform convergence is so powerful that not only does it make uh, 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 the limit continuous if the original functions are continuous it also allows you to interchange integral and limit okay so long as on the on the uh, region you are integrating in this case is a loop on that the convergence is uniform okay and of course this loop is contained uh, this simple closed contour this loop is contained inside this and there of course uniform convergence is going on so uniform convergence gives you the authority to interchange limit and integral so what will happen is this this can be written as limit k tends to infinity integral over gamma f k omega d d omega i can do this the reason why i can go from here to here is because of uniform convergence mind you but then each f k of omega is analytic by Cauchy's theorem this is 0 therefore this is 0 therefore by Morera's theorem f becomes analytic in d z0 but then since z0 is arbitrary f becomes analytic in d and that is the proof okay Morera's theorem implies f is analytic in d z0 since z0 belonging to d was arbitrary we get f is analytic in d okay so uh, this is this is this is something that you need to know uh, if you take a normal limit of analytic functions on a domain then the limiting function is certainly analytic okay fine so all right so now we come back to uh, this question uh, which is the question that is uh, answered by Hurwitz theorem and that is about uh, what is going to happen if you take uh, 0 of f okay and Hurwitz theorem basically says that the 0 of f is going to come from zeros of f k beyond a certain stage okay. So, uh, so let me so let me let me write that down uh, suppose uh, z0 belonging to d is a 0 of f f is the f is the uniform f is the normal limit of these analytic functions f case okay suppose z0 is a 0 of f Hurwitz theorem tell a uh, roughly tells us that z0 is obtained as a limit of zeros of fk for k large this is what this is this is essentially what Hurwitz theorem says okay so zero of the limit zero of the limit function the limit analytic function of a normal uh, fam uh, 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 family of functions that normally converge to a an analytic function then the zero of the limit function comes as a limit of zeros of the original functions beyond a certain stage okay now so let me so let me write down 
let me write down the uh, let me write down Hurumitsu's theorem properly let me write down the exact statement then we will uh, try to see how to prove it. So, here is Hurwitz's theorem. So, let f k normally in D suppose each f k is analytic in D then by what I have told f is also analytic on, on D ok or I should say on D if you want. Let z not in D be a 0 of f of z of order m or of order m not ok. Then then there exists rho greater than 0 with uh, mod z minus z not uh, uh, yeah so I should say then there exists rho greater than 0 and and an n greater than 0 such that each f k for k greater than or equal to n has precisely m not zeros in mod z minus z not lesser than rho and further Uh, all these zeros converge as k tends to infinity to uh, is an okay. So, uh, so you see the, the statement is something like this let me again explain. So, here is your domain D because I have been drawing a bounded domain the domain need not even be bounded ok. I am just drawing a bounded domain mind your domain is just an open connected set. So, it could be unbounded ok, but we are really not worried about boundedness because because of the normal convergence because normal convergence ensures that so long as you restrict your attention to compact subsets the convergence is uniform that is what you always need ok. So, you see the point is if you give me z naught which is 0 of the limit function f then I can find a I can find a rho uh, uh, a disc of radius rho centered at z naught such that beyond a certain stage all the functions in the sequence they also have the same number of zeros as uh, the order of the 0 of the limit function and all these zeros as you as you decrease rho ok. Uh, all these zeros uh, so in fact I should say uh, I should say uh, all these zeros converge in fact I must say as uh, as rho tends to 0 to z naught ok. So, you know if I take a particular rho then uh, there is a row first of all such that f sub capital N f sub capital N plus 1 and so on all the functions beyond the index n all those functions have exactly the same number of zeros as f has as the limiting function f has. But of course, when I say number of zeros of course, uh, 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 zeros should be counted with multiplicity ok. And the fact is that if you if you make rho smaller then you will get zeros which are you know closer and closer to z naught. So, obviously z naught will be an accumulation point of the set of all zeros 
and in, a, in other words as you make as, as you choose any one of these zeros for each row and make rows smaller and smaller you will get a sequence of zeros of the corresponding f's and they will all go and converge to z0. So if you think of it diagrammatically it is like it, it looks so you know it looks something like this if you look at fk probably you will have few zeros then if you look at fk plus 1 uh, suppose m0 is 5 I have 1 2 3 4 5 then maybe uh, you know uh, and this is z0 okay then if you take uh, if you uh, so maybe maybe I should uh, draw a bigger diagram here expand this so the situation is like this here is z0 <coughs> and these are the zeros of uh, fk k sufficiently large and if you count all these zeros with multiplicity the total will add up to m0 which is the multiplicity of the zero of f at z0 and the point is as you make this row smaller all these zeros will converge to z0 which means you know they they will just coalesce they will just blend into one another and become one point it will become a point of order m okay this is what happens this is what uh, Hurwitz theorem says okay. So I will stop with that and uh, in the next part we will in the next lecture I will explain how to prove this theorem.